but I did just book tickets to Singapore last night. Oh, um, you know how jealous I am. I know. Oh, Miriam. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm coming to wit. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to be in Singapore in October for the conference. Um, I oh, just booked okay. hotel and air and everything. And oh, I, excellent. it's been four or five years since I've been there. So I, Oh, uh, okay. It's amazing. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. I've, That's good. I've, I've been all over. I've never been to Singapore. It's like in my <laughs> top three of yeah. places I still want to go. I am yeah. so jealous. Man. You should come yeah. and come to Shanghai as well. Welcome to Connections with BCD Travel, an ongoing conversation about the modern day travel program, the impact of technology and digitization, and how travel buyers can take control and drive change. Each episode leaves you with practical, actionable advice and solutions to support a variety of program needs. Let's start connecting. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Connections with BCD Travel. I'm Chad Levin. And I'm Miriam Moscovich. As always, if you are enjoying the Connections podcast series, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're not enjoying the Connections podcast series, please stay far away from the review section. So, Chad, a few weeks ago, you told me that about 10% of our listeners come from the Asia Pacific or APAC region, right? Yeah. So I thought it would be interesting to invite one of BCD's most visible leaders onto the show and talk about what's happening in the world of business travel and how BCD is helping stabilize the region. And I thought that was an excellent idea, Miriam. So on this episode, we have Jonathan Cal, Managing Director of China for BCD Travel and a highly recruited speaker in the region. So welcome to Connections, Jonathan. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes. Thank you, Chad and Miriam. Delighted to be here. Um, as the Managing Director for Greater China for PCD Travel, I oversee our operations and strategy in the region. So I graduated from the University of Toronto, and I've been in the travel management industry for over now 20 years. So I have a good understanding of the unique dynamics of China and Hong Kong market very well, and I, that's where I work. And I'm lucky to have some of the privilege that uh, of speaking at uh, some industry events, um, maybe TV, sharing some insights on business travel management, and also what are some of the latest trends in the industry. And of course, the nuances uh, that we see in the China market, because it is a very different place. Um, and I enjoy helping companies navigate the complexities of travel management all the time. Well, we're thankful that you're here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective about business travel in the region. So let's do it. Jonathan, our first question has to be about recovery in the region and specifically in China. It's no secret that this part of the world has been a little slow to reopen post pandemic. So can you give us a kind of like state of business travel in the region or country? Certainly, Chad. The recovery of business travel in China has been slow but steady uh, since the beginning of this year on January 8th, when the China, the country officially opened up. Um, we're seeing a very strong recovery in both domestic travel and also international travel, uh, particularly in the big cities like Shanghai and Beijing. Right. So at the moment, um, our domestic flight capacity is already at 105 uh, percent in J July, so last month. Oh wow! Yeah. So it is a. Uh, it's actually more flights now than in 2019. Um, in addition to this, due to the uh, slowness of uh, international flights recovery, a lot of the Chinese carriers are actually using the wide body planes on domestic routes. So adding um, quite a bit of seats uh, to the domestic capacity. So uh, for international travel, it's still a little bit limited. Uh, we are at about 60 percent recovery compared to 2019. Um, and uh, most notably, uh, it is uh, the we see some of the routes like the U.S. and China routes. Uh, it's still lagging quite far behind. But I wanted to swap places with you guys and ask you guys the question. <laughs> okay. Can you guess now how many flights there are per week between U.S. and China right now? Oh, uh, sorry, in 2019. In 2019. Uh, yes. 2019. I don't. Uh, per week. Maybe around like. Per week. Yeah. Like 200, 250. Mirror? Yeah, I what was I was I was going to say 130. <laughs> yeah, try again. 
So there were on average around 330 flights a week uh, between the two oh, wow. countries in 2019. Yeah. But at the moment, uh, we're seeing only 24 flights a week. So that means wow. we're oh. only at 7% recovery. So we're still quite a way behind right now. Wow. So that's a long way to go on some key routes. Jonathan, I want to dig a little further into that capacity you mentioned before, and specifically capacity restoration. Where is it lacking? Where is it back? And what do travel managers of global programs need to know? Yes, excellent questions, Pierre. So capacity restoration varies across different regions internationally right now. Uh, some of the cities and countries, we're seeing a significant recovery in flights. Uh, overall, we're seeing a strong recovery of flights between uh, China and Asia Pacific region in general, like Japan, Singapore, Australia. Uh, we're seeing strong growth in Europe as well. So I think travel managers need to closely monitor the situation and work closely with trusted partners like, like us, like BCD Travel, to ensure a smooth and successful planning process. Uh, my biggest advice uh, is to start negotiate early. So I think even earlier than you would previously do or think you need to, uh, especially with the airlines and uh, other suppliers like hotels, and uh, also try to consolidate your volume with your preferred suppliers. Um, it's going to be very, very important in this market where uh, the capacity or the supply is still limited. So you see those trends continuing into next year and 2024, right? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Um, we While well, we anticipate a gradual recovery in the second half of the year, um, I think the pace will depend on various factors at play right now. So there are a couple of things, most notably is the uh, government policies and geopolitics that we talked about. Uh, I mm -hmm. think the other challenge we see is with regards to visa. So right now, we're seeing a huge bottleneck for visa applications in China. So for China travelers going outside, for example, if you try to get an appointment for a U.S. visa application today in Shanghai, the earliest time would be in November. Oh my so gosh. that's wow. four months away. And uh, for German Schengen visa, uh, they're going to tell you to come back next year as Whoa. the earliest appointment won't be available until in 2024. So it is uh, very challenging, I would say, for even for corporate travelers to plan their trip in the short term, uh, because a lot of after three years of COVID, a lot of travelers, they don't remember that you actually need a visa to travel yeah, anymore. Exactly. And you thought, OK, well, let's book a flight and book a hotel and here we go. But um, yeah, so looking ahead to 2024, uh, we do expect to see some of these challenges to be solved and supply gradually catch up to demand. Um, for a stronger recovery. Uh, you know, the visa and passport process piece is what we hear the most, or I hear the most here in my Western office in America in Denver, Colorado. I hear that that is one of the biggest challenges. But really, nuts and bolts, Jonathan, if I am a business traveler and I am in China and I need to be in America in two weeks for a very important meeting to close a piece of business, am I just out of luck? Yes, unfortunately, that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I unless, wish you uh, could see the the shock on my face. It just there yeah. is just no solution. You are just stuck. Okay. That's right. And and that's why it's an issue. I mean, there really. I mean, there really is no fast pass or speed lane or service you can pay ten x in order to get first in line, huh? No. At the yeah. moment, it's uh, just uh, because of a shortage of staff. So um, in the last two months, so we're in uh, August right now, so um, the embassy has been focusing their staff to um, process student visa. So because it's uh, for September in order to get uh, in time for September. So hopefully um, for corporate travel and leisure travel, it will be better uh, by September after school starts. Well, speaking of visas, uh, many of our listeners either manage or work for global programs and may have already started or will return to managing travel into and out of China uh, or the broader region. So is there anything that travel managers need to keep in mind regarding visa or passport services? Any tips or things to remember from you? Yes, absolutely, Chad. So passport visa services are crucial when it comes to international travel, and it's even more so right now. Um, with all the changes and ha that is happening in the rest of the world, um, I think it's essential for travel managers to stay updated on the latest requirements and regulations, especially with the continuous changes that are happening. 
So with partners like CIBT Visas that is available for uh, in our BCD marketplace, um, together with BCD Travel, uh, we can offer the latest technology solutions to help um, our clients simplify and streamline the visa application process and uh, ensuring a seamless experience and all the information is available for your travelers. Let's switch gears here, Jonathan. Staffing continues to be a huge issue for the entire travel industry. How do you see suppliers handling staffing issues in your region? Yep, indeed. Uh, Staffing has been a challenge here. Uh, Suppliers in the region are adopting innovative approaches to uh, address these issues, um, including implementing flexible working arrangements, uh, investing in employee training and development, and also uh, taking advantage of technology solutions to automate some of the tasks but I think it's still very challenging, um, and it is one of the reasons why capacity recovery has been slow here. For example, when we talk about staff shortage in the airline industry, um, most people think about the pilots and the cabin crew, uh, but the current situation uh, is we are seeing a more drastic ch- uh, shortage uh, on the ground handling staff. Um, at the airport, like the check-in staff, baggage handlers, uh, plane servicing staff that, you know, refills the plane, towing them around and setting up the staircases, etc. So I hear that uh, the Hong Kong airport now has over 10,000 openings um, that just cannot be wow. filled. Yeah. And, you know, it is a harsh working environment as well uh, with the heat wave that we're experiencing, typhoons. So it uh, it doesn't really help with the hiring and retention. So I think it continues to be a challenge in the in the region right now. Well, so now that we have that, you know, kind of well-rounded view of business travel in the region and, and China specifically, do you have any suggestions on how travel programs move forward with their travel plans? Yeah, certainly, Chad. So travel managers need to be agile and adaptable. I think it is uh, now more important than any other time to be innovative. Um, And uh, with all the information that is available, uh, we need to collaborate with trusted partners uh, in the region and also take advantage of technology solutions that have real-time data, traveler insights. Um, By embracing an innovative and adopting proactive approach, Travel managers can navigate the changing landscape and deliver um, exceptional travel experience for their organizations. Great advice. Uh, But I do want to throw you one curveball before this session is done and ask about low-cost carriers uh, or airline startups. Uh, Any notable entries or changes to that landscape in China? Yeah, actually not a whole lot in China. Uh, Most of the airlines here are state-owned, so owned by the government. Um, It is quite difficult uh, for LCCs to start off, uh, but one notable exception is uh, Spring Airlines. They offer both domestic and international flights, majority out of Shanghai, which is their headquarters. Um, At the moment, um, LCC only represents around 7% capacity in China. You just mentioned domestic international flights, and I'm curious about your take on key routes and business destinations. Yes, absolutely, Miriam. Uh, In terms of international travel, we're seeing a gradual recovery in popular business destinations like Singapore, Hong Kong, and some of the European cities. Uh, However, one of the market that is lacking behind is Japan. So prior to the pandemic, there were three countries uh, that enjoyed a 15-day visa-free travel to China, and they are Singapore, Brunei, and Japan. The visa-free status was suspended during the pandemic, but Singapore and Brunei status have been reinstated just a couple of weeks ago. However, Japanese travelers currently still require a visa to come to China, which causes a softness in the demand. Um, China has been an important market for Japan as approximately 30% of Japan's total international flight capacity uh, back in 2019 was to China. So this is not good for corporate travel between the two countries right now. One last question. Can you talk a little bit about sustainable travel program priorities for China versus APAC versus globally? So while some of the uh, similarities in travel program priorities across China, APAC, and also global contacts, um, there are also unique aspects to consider. In China, for example, there is a strong reliance on rail for this travel because of the high-speed rail network can go up to over um, 350 kilometers an hour. So normally, rail has an advantage over air travel for trips under 
uh, 1,000 kilometers. Uh, and also for special routes like Shanghai and Beijing, which uh, ha has a very high frequency, uh, 15 minutes, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a train ride. Um, however, there is also a uh, growing recognition of the importance of sustainable and responsible travel practices. Um, this is mandated by the Chinese government with a goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2060, which aligns also with global trends. But one thing that is different in China is whenever the government sets its goals on something, uh, we immediately see a lot of action in the marketplace. So for BCE China, we are working with Advito as we speak on this. So stay tuned for more information. And Jonathan, anything to add before we close this segment out? Yes. So in short, um, I want your listeners and travel managers to know China is different. And I'd like to emphasize the importance of uh, collaboration and partnership in navigating the complexities of business travel. BCD Travel is dedicated to helping businesses succeed in the region, uh, especially in China by offering innovative solutions, the local expertise, and personalized support. Together, we can overcome challenges and unlock new opportunities in the evolving landscape of travel here in China. Well, Jonathan, I knew you would come on the show with a wealth of information, uh, but now we want to get to know a little bit more about you with our Quick Connect segment. So, first question. What is everyone's favorite holiday or celebration and why? I think it's got to be the Chinese New Year or sometimes called the Spring Festival. Um, so this is the time of family gathering and great food. I think mine would have to be Halloween uh, simply because I the classic. I love, even as an adult, dressing up with my friends, going bar hopping, and uh, just kind of being ridiculous for an mm -hmm. evening. Nice. Uh, yeah. For me, it would have to be New Year's. And I started a tradition many years ago. Unfortunately, the last couple of years, I haven't been able to maintain it. But I like to try to spend New Year somewhere other than where I live. Um, I want to yeah, see someone okay. else's fireworks. I want to see the, the New Year celebration somewhere else. So um, yeah. I've spent, you know, in the past, I've spent it on cruise ships in the Caribbean or in Europe, <laughs> um, in Abu Dhabi with some friends. So New Year's is it for me. Have you all ever been to a, like, hidden gem travel destination? And if so, where was it? So I've been to many places in China, and uh, my favorite uh, is a place called Huangshan, which literally means the Yellow Mountain. Uh, it is not a tall mountain in terms of elevation, only around um, 1,800 meter, uh, but it is well known for its scenery with the clouds and the snow uh, and the vegetation as well. It looks like different uh, a different place every season you go. I, uh, no secret, live in the USA, um, and I had to live for a few months in the state of West Virginia. Uh, very small, not very populated, but just naturally beautiful. And there's an area called the New River Gorge Bridge uh, that was home to, for decades, the world's tallest single arch suspension bridge, uh, I think mm -hmm. is how you say it. And it's just... Yeah. You go out on these mountains and it's just, you know, forest as far as you can see, nothing else around you. And it, 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 it looks like something out of a movie or a painting. It's just unbelievably beautiful. So very hidden gem. Wow. Nice. Well, I myself am a, a hot springs kind of person. So I would say mm. one of the hidden gems, maybe it's not so hidden out here in Colorado, is – um. Mount Princeton, the collegiate peaks out on the western slope in Colorado. Um, there is hot springs there. Uh, there's natural hot springs, and there are mineral springs, so they don't smell like sulfur. So when I need some R&R, &R, I, like <laughs> I like to cross over that first uh, set of Rockies and head down into the western slope near South Park. Yeah, a little R&R uh, uh, &R for you. A little springs. hot springing. Yeah. yeah. When you transit in Japan, you should go to like one of the onsen there. They have a lot of onsen in Japan. Yeah. The hot springs. Yeah. Oh, I'll put it on the list. I, I hope yeah. to spend like 10, 10 to 12 days in Japan sometime next year. And I want to go in the yeah. winter. Um, all right. Last question, Jonathan. And we promise not to make too much fun of you if you choose wrong here. But uh, we have to mm -hmm. know when you travel for work, window or aisle seat? Aisle for sure. Um, I really hate the uh, feeling that uh, I'm getting stuck on the window side and have to ask someone to excuse me. Uh, when I have to go, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then the three of us would travel well together. Miriam and I are both uh, window seat people. Uh, God, I just, I don't know. 
I all feels uncomfortable to me for some reason. <laughs> like, like Jonathan said, when he needs to go, he needs to get when up and go, go somewhere. He's gotta go. I don't know yeah. where he's going. <laughs> See, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you only have a oh. few feet of clearance. Where are yeah. you going? Yeah, exactly. Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, this was really insightful. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us, Jonathan. We appreciate it. Agree, Jonathan. It was great. And if there's anyone that can entice us to want to cross a couple oceans to come visit you, uh, you are the one. Well, thank you for having me here. And I look forward to seeing you guys in this part of the world. If you're a travel buyer, frequent business traveler, or just someone who likes hearing about travel in the Asia Pacific region, be sure to like, subscribe, follow, download, you know the drill, the Connections podcast uh, to stay up to date with new releases and listen to your favorite episodes. Thank you for connecting with us. BCD Travel helps customers travel smart and achieve more. We make this happen in over 100 countries with a global client retention rate of 97%, the highest in the industry. Learn more about the information you heard today and what BCD Travel can do for you by visiting bcdtravel.com forward slash podcast.